Uh, well, uh, you got me off that door, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So I'll start. Have you been sending job applications or attending interviews without success? Are you sick and tired of your current job? Or you just graduated? Perhaps, unfortunately, you got retrenched, laid off or fired. What is it that you haven't been doing right? Are you ready and willing to find out? Do not think there are no jobs. How to get a job in Dubai is crafted with you in mind. It offers the perfect A to Z guide for you to get your most desired job. Whether you're in Dubai, planning to travel to Dubai, or you just want to apply for that job from the comfort of your home country. The wealth of information you get from this book will not only help you to get a job in Dubai, but in whichever place you are. This book will, will enlighten you in a way no other book will. You will get the most hidden secrets on job searching, a comprehensive understanding of the UAE general life, residency, yes. visa, language, law, culture, labor laws, employment contracts, preliminary steps to work and much more. Most importantly, it helps you craft compelling customized CVs and cover letters and takes you through from preparation for the interview, assessing it, negotiation for, the, for a better path and signing the offer letter and contract. This book does not, does not only open your mind, it makes you shine and grasp the recruiter's attention through its up-to-date practical and required steps with compelling detailed examples. Delve in and know who, what, where, when, why, and how to get a job you saw your for. That's it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. wow. I think uh, you, you've raised the questions, you've provided the answers, you uh, and you've promised us much more in the book. Eh? <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is much, much, much more than, than what is just in the cover. Mm, I think definitely yeah. we, this will form part of the discussion that we will have today. And, and uh, hopefully we could, you know, base our next Fishing Abroad session on this. And I'm very, yeah. I'm very sure you, you will engage and, uh, you know, maybe even ask some questions or provide some answers together with the guests of the day today. Yeah, definitely. Ah, uh, ah. Thank you, and, 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 and thank you for allowing me to read uh, that part. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. I know maybe one, one, some, someone could have a question, and uh, we will have all this time to share. So, yes, Mikhail. <laughs> yes, Mikhail, I can see you smiling, but I can't hear your voice. <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh, I think I think I was I was muted. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Mikhail, you are welcome. Uh, we are now good to go. We'll just start from where we are, then uh, some other people will join us, including okay. Steve. Yeah. So the whole idea is uh you know to hear from you and uh, to hear your story and to for you to answer some questions here. There is only one person who knows you very well. And I think she's oh, even yeah. left. She was your roommate at some point in KU. Oh my God. <laughs> nice. I think other than other than that person, eh, I, I also think I know you uh, quite a bit. So I I will say what I know about you, but give you the chance to explain much more. All right. Um, you know, I, I have your profile, you the, the profile you sent me, but I conveniently chose not to read it or not to refer to it because I wanted to speak from the heart as much as possible. Uh, I have the privilege of knowing you from the days we were in KU and uh, sharing uh, part of the, the dream. You, I remember you shared with me your dream at some point. You know, you wanted very particularly to work for organizations like UN, or to further your studies abroad. I remember you doing. I remember you doing very many SAT ex, SAT exams, and you are very committed to it. It is like you already decided, and um, you are doing everything to achieve it. So uh, the greatest story now that we are writers, eh, writers always look for stories. So the greatest story is that you achieved all these things that you are <laughs> working so hard to achieve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that is part of the reason why we would really wish to hear your story. So uh, 
I don't know where you'd wish to start from this, but I would just wish to welcome you uh, so that you can be able to tell us your story, starting from, let's say, 2015 or 2016, when you are still uh, a member of the choir in KU and you are traveling with Muganda <laughs> uh, to now. So give us a bit of your story, uh, then we can then be able to go into the questions, or questions and answers. How do you take advantage of the many opportunities that are around us? Which opportunities are these? Uh, maybe basing it from your examples of taking part as a fellow in Yali and also at, at the, as being a evening scholar. So over to you, Mikal. I wish there was a way to clap. Uh, <laughs> you can clap here in the comments. <laughs> that would be yes, really yes. very good to see. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for inviting me here. My name is Mikal Waga. Um, wow. My story is long, and it would take a really long time. But just in a nutshell, I was in KU, Kenyatta University. I was in School of Public Health, and I studied health informatics for my undergraduate. That's in KU, it's called health information management. Um, and during that time, I, I had the privilege of meeting people like Gabrielle when I was in my first and second year. And it was amazing because I was taking part in so many things. So. Uh, naturally, I've always been that person who tries a lot of things. I push myself to, to try a lot of things. Um, but my, my desire to study abroad and to take part in, in an activity that was outside of our country started a, a really long time ago. I started with SAT. So when I graduated from four, I got um, into the Zawadi Africa program. I, I'm, I'm sure that probably some of you have heard of it. It's a program by Susan Boyer and the Kennedy, uh, Kennedy Pamela, Pamela and Kennedy Boyer airlift. Um, so in that program, what they do is they take top performers, sometimes people who have a particular grade, sometimes it's A minus, sometimes it's B plus, and they mentor them into trying to apply for opportunities abroad. So I tried for two or three years and it just, it just didn't work out for me. I got admitted into a number of schools, but I didn't get fully funded scholarship. And you know, if you come from 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 where we come from, Kenya, if you're going abroad, the school fees there is 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 huge in terms of if you look at the currency differences. So I had my mindset from a really 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 young age that i wanted to have something that was fully funded so usually that's what i would target that's what i went for um and then after that i i cleared from from ku i i just started from from my university from those for those people who were joining so after that i cleared from ku and immediately got into vso the international citizenship service um volunteering program and that really helped me have like an entrance into development. But for a long time, I had always wanted to work for organizations like like the UN, like WHO. And so right when I finished that, I, I had the privilege of, of um, um, an internship with UNHCR. And it's during this time that I really got the gist of of what happens in international bodies like like that so um i was basically in my life at a place where i wanted to do something more i felt like i wanted to get out and try new things out of the country and and i think this was largely driven by the fact that in kenya there are sometimes um opportunities are there but sometimes you just want to try other things so this is mainly what drove my decision um and i think what people don't see is is how many times i tried and so when i right after completing my my undergraduate and and thinking about moving into a postgraduate i remember applying for close to 50 opportunities close to 50 of them 
and a couple of them turned turned out well because I had uh, different interviews with organizations such as Mandela Roads Foundation and and Chivning and and I remember applying to different countries but I was very sure that I wanted to go west I never tried countries in, like China Japan I was just really sure that I, I wanted to go west so I think the shorty really helped my my decision and and what I was doing then so um, basically I had organized uh, something to help me put my thoughts through and to make it as natural and as honest as possible um, if you uh, if you're in a place where you feel like you want to do more and you want to um, get out there and try more I think as we are looking for opportunities job opportunities in different countries maybe a scholarship opportunity is one of those that you might want to consider and Kenya being being now mo having moved from a lower income country to a lower middle income country that sets us on a platform where we can actually go for much much more of these opportunities because they're available and so um, Organizing ourselves with that knowledge is, 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 is really, really useful. So I'll take you through my journey from the time that I graduated KU to the time that I now got into, into Chivning. And I'll, make it, I'll try and make it very brief because God will say that I have 15 minutes. Um, and please let me know if you can hear me in the chats because I... Can you hear me? Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, in a nutshell, I studied health information management, which translates to health informatics. Um, I loved it, I really did love it. And for me, it was, it was a course that I found to be really, really interesting because of health innovation now is a big deal. And, and if you look at how the world is shifting, how healthcare is shifting. Health innovation, healthcare technologies will be at the center of it. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to hop onto uh, so that I take off with the sheep, of course, being, being, being an opportunist again. So um, when I decided to apply for, for a master's um, a degree, I was looking for an opportunity that would one allow me to be as flexible as possible uh, two would enable me to have exposure in a country that i have never lived in and i have never been in uh, three that would uh, give me an opportunity to travel as much as possible um, there are some countries that if you go to you might be limited just to that country but i particularly liked the idea of of uk because you know, UK was, was, I think was and still is up till this December this year, uh, part of European Union. So it means that you can basically travel across different countries um, and get access to different countries just because you are already in that territory. So I was looking at it that way. But also when I was 19, I always really wanted to go to Europe. And for me, it was just a dream then. I just thought, you know, this, I looked at movies and I looked at, <laughs> I looked at, uh, you know, history textbooks. And I just thought, wow, it must be quite fascinating to travel around and see these places that people talk about in the books. So that was also. If you hear me, I feel like I'm, my screen is stuck. Okay, okay, I think I'm back. All right. So, um, yes, is it okay now? Yes, it's better now. Uh, we can hear and see you. <laughs> so proceed. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, 
when leaving Kenya, I, I just didn't want to go to any other institution. So for me, I researched. I did a lot of research and I found out that there are particular schools that are really good at the course that I wanted um, to pursue. And so I mostly targeted those schools. Uh, that was my, my, my strategy for application. And I, I looked at different countries within Europe and applied to schools that were known for that course. Um, and which had opportunities that were likely to be fully funded because I couldn't go for a half-funded opportunity. So it, it was a long journey. I don't want to lie to you. It was, it was long. I applied so many times. I wrote hundreds of essays. I can't even remember some of them. Um, and if I remember very accurately, I, I documented approximately 50 different opportunities that I applied for. Um, and what helped was that I did not just target one. I targeted, say, for example, if there's a school, this school has four or five other possibilities of scholarships that could fund a particular course. I went for that. And so, you know, if you apply to one school and you apply to, to four other uh, potential scholarships that you could get into the school, then it lessens your, your work because there's not too much, like if it was for different schools, you'd have to apply to four different schools and four different scholarships. But if you, if you target um, one, that, one that has several other scholarships, then yes, it, it, it makes your work a little bit easier. Um, so Chibning was one of those that came through for me and the process was really, really tedious. It had, you know, applications and interview, interviewing and, and waiting. I think the worst part about a scholarship application is the wait. Guys, nobody prepares you for that. It's so intense, especially if you really, really want it. But ultimately, you know, um, something usually, usually does come through. I would like now to take you through... Um, the process of moving from Kenya now into into the UK. So, for example, Chivning is, is one of those, and, and the guidelines for, for application of the scholarship is basically online. Um, I'm happy to share links if, if any of you is not familiar with it. But for me, the, the shift moving and leaving everything basically in my country into a different country and trying to settle in was not an easy one. It was it was really difficult because you're leaving everything that you're familiar with and moving into a different place. So it takes a bit of mental strength, um, I would say, because the weather here is actually quite different. Even now it's raining, sometimes it's cold, you're always in between hot and cold. And, and it can get really frustrating because especially if you're someone who doesn't like cold weather, it can get really, really, really really frustrating but there are the parks where you know you have you have really good transport system and and you have an opportunity to learn and not be able to pay a single shilling and it's basically like someone is paying you to study I think it's it's amazing and it's something that that is another avenue if you would like to explore or to consider um, leaving probably an area where you're comfortable, which is our country, uh, Kenya, and, and probably trying out elsewhere. So the, the other thing is that, you know, the movement is, you know, it's, it's, it's not too difficult if you have, if you have a scholarship. The settling, is, is, the settling in is also not uh, too difficult if you have a scholarship. I think probably if you don't have a scholarship, you have a partial scholarship, it gets a bit tricky because you always have the pressure of, you know, I have to work, I have to find work for me to be able to, to balance the space in between. But it's a little bit more comfortable if you get a scholarship. So for me, what I would, I would advise anyone who's thinking about taking up this, this alternative is if you come the scholarship way, the better. Uh, but if you can afford it and, and you, can, you, can, you can pay for it, then by all means, take the plunge. Um, and so while here, I'll briefly tell you about, about some of the opportunities that um, are available while here. So one is the 
the kind of work opportunities you have access to. Uh, for example, for me in the last last year between between November and December, I had an opportunity to to work with a property management uh, company that's really high end, and you have access to to a lot of high outer network individuals who really motivate you. You know, um, people who who are by all definitions successful from all over the world and you know most of them come to London and they spend their holidays uh, here so I had an opportunity to work with them and talk to them a lot of them happened to be um, celebrities and people who who have attained something for themselves yeah so when 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 you get when you get here there are other opportunities that always open up so like internship opportunities international internship opportunities um job opportunities um and then phd opportunities though what i've learned uh, over time is that uh, for anyone who's interested in pursuing a phd most of them are usually home only or eu funded so sometimes there is value in applying for a phd in our country and then looking for looking for opportunities uh, where universities partner with external universities like say university of nairobi partners with um another a different university in a different country so those opportunities are there but i think it's an area that hasn't been explored as much so for example for for writers what i've seen and and usually i would i would pull in gabriel whenever i see something like this it's a uh, they have they usually have opportunities for exchange um, um you only need to know where they are but they are there opportunities for exchange where 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 if if especially for those of you who are still in uni you can come to to there's a there's an arrangement called erasmus mundus you can come through erasmus mundus and and contribute your work um and and have someone also you know exchange with you or or go to the same um, go go to the same university that you went to in order to learn what you're doing there. So I saw that as an avenue that hasn't been explored mostly by 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 Kenyans because the people I saw who were taking up these opportunities were people from other African countries, especially South Africa and Zambia. Uh, so that's one of the areas that probably we would also look um, into. I think for now I'm done unless you have. Uh, any questions I was just basically talking more about my journey and how how um, it influenced my decision and 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 taking you briefly through the process but I'm happy to answer any questions that you would have thank you thank you very much Carl. <laughs> you all the way from KU you've taken us through your journey and uh, the strong desire that you had coupled with uh, a lot of hard work eh? applying to the tune of the tune of 50 um, you mentioned something to do with 100 you know you applied to 100 institutions and many more the many exams and the essays you wrote thank you for taking us through that brief journey i believe we can be able then to see a, a little picture of uh, your journey to getting to where you are now so maybe we could just take a question or two uh if if there is a burning question somewhere i saw annie and your decad has really been you know, looking forward and exploring the opportunities to travel and uh, study in canada in the uk so this is a good chance to ask a question or two though uh, we will also i'm very grateful that we have steve join us though the the time difference is quite a lot in um the time zones have uh, are not very favorable to him. He should be sleeping now, but he's very kind to join us. So we'll also have him to just speak briefly. Then we can do a joint question and answer. Okay. So if anyone has a question, uh, now you can ask. Just two or three. Um, how easy or hard is it to secure scholarships in the West? That is from Annie. Oh, okay. Um... I think the idea is to make yourself really competitive. So how do you start? You you know you have to know what it is you're applying for. And then I think as writers you have an advantage with this because you have to be able to communicate what it is you have done that's in line with what you're applying for. I think that gives you a really, really huge advantage if you're able to very, very clearly communicate what it is that you did that's in line with that. For example, 
I'll use an example of myself. Um, I, I had an opportunity to intern with UNHCR and UNAIDS and hospitals and uh, community-based organizations and different NGOs. So what I did was to very clearly communicate how this work um, has, been, has been useful in shaping my desire for, for that particular course. And, and when you're applying for a scholarship, what they're always looking for is, is how are you going to add value to yourself in such a way that you'll be valuable to others in the community, in the community that you're going to go back to as well. So most of the community, most of the scholarships will, will want to add value to someone who goes back and, and um, applies the same to their community. So activities that you're doing now, those small activities that you're doing now, how you communicate them would be very, very important um, in your application. But I would say that it's not as difficult because there are, there are scholarships that take up to 500 people at a go. So if you see those, then your chances are much higher, regardless of whether um, it's, it's within, it's within it's, they're looking for particular people within a continent or within which is global. For example, Chivning is global. So it's, it's a conglomeration of 147 uh, countries. And so they're they are selecting people from that. But there are other scholarships that will come up and they need 500 people from Africa. So you see with that, your chances, especially coming from Kenya is high. And, and especially if you have, if you are targeting uh, your efforts towards what it is you're applying for. It's, it's, I would advise anyone who, who think, who's thinking about it uh, to really focus your energies on what it is you're applying for and then sell yourself with what you have done before and what you desire to do um, in the future. And there are lots of options in the West because if you look at each and every country, um, especially in the European Union and the UK, um, usually they have a scholarship scheme so it's just interesting what country and then once you have once you know the country you're interested in, or even if you don't because for some people like me when I was starting the idea was just I want to get something for myself I wasn't specific about the country except I knew that I wanted to go west but um, if you're like that then just apply throughout like ap apply across so that you have even higher chances of getting accepted but it's 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 not it's not too difficult i would say however it's competitive yeah thank you very much and i hope you the answer that was provided helped you you can provide you can still ask a follow up question if you need some clarification on an area I see a gentleman called Elishama asks, there are a number of sites advertising scholarship opportunities. How would you verify the right site? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. Don't ever pay anything to, <laughs> to anybody who's telling you about, about uh, uh, scholarship sites. What I've seen is a lot of people now are taking advantage of, of people. If you're a writer, and especially because I believe that you be, especially members of this group, I'm sure you have written something. You have written an essay, you have written a report, you have written something that communicates what you desire to communicate. That already is an advantage. So you basically know how to communicate what it is you want to say. So um, what you would need is just guidance and not um, for someone to do it for you or write it for you. So one, if you see a website that's asking you for money, the opportunity could be right, but probably um it's 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 someone who's trying to take advantage of of people um so and then the second one is once you see any 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 scholarship opportunity on any website google it just to confirm that it's actually existing um so for example if you see you know this and this uh, this and this xyz university is offering this and this amount google that and if you see it on Google and you, and you click on it, go directly to the website of if it's an institution or if it's a center or something, go directly to the institution and verify first before you attempt um, to apply for it. Um, I know that I can, I'll, Gabriel, what I'll do is I will yeah. create a list of at least uh, 45 different mm. sites yeah. or, and share with you and, and the team 
so that yeah. anyone who's interested in finding out um, the different uh, scholarships can subscribe you know have an, have your email subscribed to those websites and then you can always have regular updates so you can get to choose what you want uh, from from the options that you have thank you very much for that kind offer and sacrifice that yeah. you'll make for the, the rest thank so you no one did this for me by the way i did it on my own <laughs> so you guys are really lucky ah, okay thank you very much for that um yeah, and I see uh, when Steve, Steve has uh, shared something. Uh, ev every scholarship advertising site puts an official link uh, to the university. I would wish that just at that point, uh, you know, Steve can be able to chip in and right. uh, take 10 minutes or so to tell us his journey. Then we can do a joint question and answer between Steve and Mika. So Steve, you may just switch on your video if it is possible. And then you take 15 minutes to tell us about your journey how did you start and uh, where did you start and how far is it now? I know you quite personally and I remember very many instances where you are, uh, I've always admired your zeal. So tell us about it. Okay, uh, thanks Gabriel. I um, feel like I'm still sleepy, so I don't know whether it's <laughs> still okay to put on the video, but let's see. Uh, there we go. Yeah, you are not. Uh, we we can't see that you are sleepy. So proceed. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so guys, uh, I would have really like to join at six a.m. Oh yeah, yeah. At three, was it three three p.m. Yeah, yeah. That was my six a.m. So I was still I was still asleep. Uh, but thanks to Gabriel, at least I'm a funny cousin Zuri. Um. So. Uh, so, so basically. Um. I would say scholarship opportunities and uh, looking for opportunities abroad, it's it's a big, it's a long process, and I I view it as a journey rather than uh, like a one-off thing. Um. So. So the, I think the most critical bit is 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 first identifying whether whether you are willing to uh, go through the process. Uh, I know uh, I know people who always have the mindset that I want to start today, and uh, in a few months I want to be in this uh, I want I want to be in this country, and that that sort of pushes a lot of people to take shortcuts. I've seen people lose money. I've seen people lose uh, uh, lose lose big uh, big 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 uh, big. Uh, big opportunities just because they thought uh, uh shortcut was the way whereas uh, without the appreciation of the journey so so from my personal experience i think i started like in 20 around 2014 those are like six, six years ago and i remember i tried this on my own I, I I wrote my first essays. I wrote my first personal statement. Uh, uh, submitted the first application, and and I got a number of regrets uh, all through up to 2018. So we are talking about four years of uh, sending in applications, uh, getting uh, you know getting regrets, uh, getting partial scholarships, uh, being put on waiting list, and all that. And that's because I, I was I was one I was going on my own I was doing all these things from my from the comfort of my uh, little space I never I never contacted people who've gone through the process so in short I was doing all this blindly and and those are the mistakes I would want uh, everyone here to avoid and and I'll tell you why uh, one the moment you. The moment you 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 are writing maybe a scholarship application for a program like Shevening or uh, Commonwealth or Fulbright, there are specific things they are looking for, and there's a way they want you to articulate those things. Uh, for instance, they would ask for your leadership experience. Uh, it's not just saying that you've been a leader, but going deeper to show like how you've 
you've lived uh, that leadership experience. And this is where sometimes they even look for evidence of articles that you've written in that in that sector. Uh, they're looking for, they would want to hear uh, of people who benefited from your leadership uh, journey or something. So they're looking for depth. But then for me on the other side, when I was doing my articles before, uh, before I knew what, how things were being done, I would say, oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a leader. I've been, uh, you know, I've been, I've been leading this group of people. I, you know, I have communication, better communication skills. I can mobilize people. But they're not looking for those generalistic sort of uh, uh, expressions. They are looking for something deeper. Can you tell us, as a leader, what did you do? What are those actionable things? And, and I would, and the right way would have to rephrase this thing and say, um, you know, I uh, when I was working for Writers Guild, I championed, you know, uh, the public uh, uh, the publication of this number of books. So, if you say like, I, I, as the CEO of Writers Guild, I championed the publication of uh, ten books during my my tenure of office. So that's that's a more stronger statement than just saying that you're leading a team of uh, of writers. If you tell me you're leading a team of writers, I th 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 for me that that's not deep enough. But then if you tell me that uh, you re you led a team of writers, and and this helped uh, push out uh, this number of books uh, within this period that that's a more elaborate statement so sort of a very, very fine they're very fine details but they get you uh, over and above others who are still applying for the same scholarship because the whole idea is you're competing uh, all these scholarships all these opportunities is about competition uh, you have like thousands and thousands of brilliant people applying for these opportunities and the the biggest challenge with uh, the biggest challenge with some of these um, some of these competi uh, some of these competitions uh, is you are all playing sort of you're coming you're all coming from a very uh, educated point of view so you cannot use your first class honors or your second class honors upper as the negotiating ground. So that you have to, to offer more. Then, apart from like, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's a bit of a, uh, sort of a background. So it, it should be more of, um, more of firming, up, firming up what you know and firming up what you know and trying to make use of people who've gone simil through similar programs. And I've seen, I've seen after after going through the hustle for four years of doing it alone, within two years, that is 2019 and 2020, I've helped around uh, around 12 people to get scholarships abroad. Just starting with the journey with them from the essay process to the point that they are able to, to, to get a scholarship offer. So you can imagine, I've walked through with people, 12 people, and if they've got it, most of them are, were actually first timers. Most of them, you, you, if, you, if, if we compare their essay by the time they were coming in and the time they got the scholarship, you wouldn't believe because we had to do a lot of data back and forth. So that, that thing of getting clarity, uh, uh, it needs, uh, it needs uh, guidance and it, it needs, uh, need, needs some sort of help. So don't shy away from reaching out to alumni who've gone through some scholarship programs don't shy away from asking for help and particularly men i'm seeing you uh men shy away from this i uh, i'm ashamed to say that uh, i think out of the out of the 12 i've only had uh, i've only had three men nine are women and and, and it's, it's so sad because uh, even when you tell a man like uh, go and revise your essay i don't like the way this reads Someone will look at you and be like, uh, "Hey, but now you you you're too harsh." But but it's not it's not about harshness, but just about knowing what is needed. And uh, I think that's the beauty of uh, someone who's gone through the fire. At least they can be able to to get give you a that eye. 
So don't shy away from reaching out to people for help. Uh, you might reach out to me, you might reach out to people like Mikal and any other person who's gone through the scholarship that you're targeting. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is try to document the work you are doing as early as now. Uh, I, I just saw, uh, I just saw uh, Gabriel sharing uh, my blog. So that's one way of documenting the work that I've been doing because when 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 you're applying for some of these scholarships uh your your essays or your work is being reviewed by by strangers if i may put it that way these are people who don't know you these are people who appreciate when they can actually see uh more than more than what you're saying in a in an essay statement so if they're able to see the evidence of what you're saying they, they they're happy they're actually more they, they would actually consider you more so if you're a writer try to have your own blog or if you can take advantage of writers guild i, I and perhaps this is, a, this is a recommendation i'm giving uh writers guild could actually profile everyone who is part of the team uh just to have their yeah to, to have their profiles on their website because i know sometimes owning a blog or setting up a website might be a, a tedious process uh, but writers guild could actually set up a, a a page which shows okay these are the people who we have in our, in our network these are the people this is the contribution that they've made and just have everyone uh having like one or two lines about themselves within the writers guild uh kenya website so that that way um you can actually have something to to show or, or to sort of cement what you're saying about your about your work. Then um, the other thing is about getting involved in um, getting involved in projects and voluntary projects, uh, community projects, things that give you visibility. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be out in the public eye. It might be an in, taking in an internship in a, in a regional organization. Uh, it might be uh, taking up uh, some, some activities in your local community and have the work documented. Um, it might be documented in form of an article. It might be uh, documented in form of uh, um, a YouTube video. It might be just some, just just a place where we can actually come back after after a few years and say, okay, oh yeah, so you you actually volunteering in this program or you actually interned in this in this organization. So when I when I when I mention about um, something like internship, uh, you need to be in a place that can offer you recommendation letters. I, I've seen people to struggle uh, because they burned bridges in some of the organizations or some of the programs they were in, and they they are not they are not able to get uh, they are not able to get uh, recommendation letters or people who can actually speak uh, uh, boldly about boldly about them. And and when when we get to that point of recommendations, um, sometimes I see institutions some organizations giving people one or two lines uh, saying oh this person is, 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 is uh, was a committed person in the organization and we would highly recommend them for any program that that, that in itself is just a a very shallow recommendation you need to be in a space you need to be in a space or you need to be uh to be with 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 some referees or in a, in in setups that give you like almost a whole page of recommendations someone going to detail about you someone who has the uh, i mean organizations or, or platforms that give you you know that can unpack you you know they can start from your your ability to do the work uh get to the point where they can talk about your leadership abilities get to a point where they can uh, they literally get to a point where they can vouch for you uh and speak uh boldly and broadly about you um yeah so so, so that that's sort of uh the basics um 
I, I don't I don't know which other direction uh, Gabriel you might want me to take because uh, uh, because if it's about the sites and where to get these scholarships I think uh, we can always share the links um, yeah. then if it's about mm -hmm. the uh, if it's about the the, the the guidance and all that because I'm always I'm always happy to do this uh, but one thing I always insist is much of the effort is on your side and even by the time you're getting the scholarship you don't get it because of my guidance my guidance is just an enabler uh otherwise the bulk of the work is uh is is, is on your on your end yeah okay thank you very much Banaski. we we are very keen to hear your journey and uh, you know, and you've even made it better by sharing some of the lessons you learned as you are trying to get these opportunities. So maybe to make it a little bit more personal, you can be able to tell us. Um, the last time we spoke, you told me about uh, that you you did a masters um, in, in University of Manchester. Then soon after, you got another opportunity in Canada. And I think you had two opportunities at a go. You had to reject one. So it appears that you know you you have many options. At least you you have many options to that end. Maybe you can just be able to share a bit of that. The the opportunities you had, the offers you had, the ones you've taken, the ones you've not taken, and why you took the ones you took. Before we then open it up to everyone to ask a, a question, then we will do a joint uh, answer, a joint question and answer with Mikhail okay uh so so the the, the I, I got chevening in 2018 um which was which was like one of the scholarship scholarships that i was really targeting and uh, uh for chevening it i i did my first application in 2015 i i got a regret in 2016 i decided not to apply then uh in 2017 someone offered to help me uh with essay, essay reviews and just offering guidance and and that's that's how i ended up in the program uh that's how i ended up getting getting the the, the offer in 2018. so 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 let me say it, it was a, a sort of a perseverance uh, a journey of perseverance because in between i got um I got I got quite a number of uh, I mean I did quite a number of applications and I got literally got regrets <laughs> and uh, I kept on applying and, and that was it. Um, then one of the one of the scholarship that I got a regret for uh, within uh, between between twenty fifteen and twenty between twenty fifteen and twenty eighteen later came through when I was almost finishing shivening and that's how I'm in Canada. So it's known as African leaders African leaders of tomorrow. So um, so and, and this is where I think I, I would I would want to put put it out there that uh, sometimes you you might even just apply for some of these opportunities just to be in their database. Because you never know. I, I remember like African leaders of tomorrow, they brought in a regret early early 2018. And later, I think five months later, I was able to get shivening and I took up shivening because I didn't I didn't have any other any other uh, options. Only for only for African leaders of tomorrow to come through in 2019, because they are like, hey Steven, we've got some ad additional funding and we are in our last phase of this program. So if you're still interested in this program, we, we would want to consider you. We would want to give you an offer. So, uh, so for me, it was a debate between whether I should, I should say no or, or yes, and what was the advantage that I was getting from, uh, from, from this whole process. So let me say I've had, that, I've had like a back-to-back because -back I started school in September 2018, finished uh, finished my research in august 2019 and i i actually remember submitting my 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 my, my, my dissertation uh, on my way to i mean on my way to canada so so it was it was a very it was a very back to back uh, sort of 
arrangement and now I've, i'm already done with the with the i'm already done with the canada masters uh sort of I've, i'm done with the coursework so I'm, I'm just finalizing on my research project which uh which should be which i should be able to submit in like two months so and that will be it i'll have two masters within uh, within a span of two years and all these have, have been fully funded all these uh, uh came through when i least expected but one thing i can assure you is uh, for shavening i had to ask for someone's help someone had to someone had to review my essays for me to to go through uh someone had to prepare me for the interviews i remember doing a dry run interview uh with a friend and they told me like if i were the one on the other side i would have given you a zero and that was that was that was terrible for someone just to to tell me that but it, it just upped my game and that's why i i really insist on asking for help uh because i've seen what it means to 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 have a helping hand in some of these journeys so so it's just those two scholarships um otherwise the others have been a lot of travel opportunities um and all these normally come through you know applying getting regrets uh getting the advantage of being put in the organization's database and then the next time they're 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 sending out opportunities they'll definitely reach out to anyone within their database so sometimes i would say and, and i think this is a culture that we've not yet embraced sometimes it's just good to apply for things even when you know you don't have the qualifications not that you're trying to waste time but you're trying to get your 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 email address your contact details into that organization because what most organizations do is they try to retain the, the the contacts of anyone who's applied for these opportunities and what they'll do next time they have these opportunities they'll the first people they'll broadcast these opportunities to is the people within their database because organizations struggle in reaching out to people by the way uh, just to let you know some of these organizations abroad uh, they struggle to to you know because they want to have these opportunities broadcasted as as far as possible as far as they they can so they see you who is in their database as one of their uh one of their what do you call it uh one of their <laughs> let me for the lack of a better word uh la one of their sales person or one of the people who would drive out these opportunities to others so yeah yeah i think i think it's uh we should embrace that culture of just get, applying for opportunities even when we don't qualify uh yeah wow <laughs> thank you very much steve eh? you know you uh you mentioned it rightly that we don't that we have not embraced that culture to try things eh? we always yeah. just look at it and see i think i don't qualify and i don't apply that is a great challenge to all of us eh? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Steve, for sharing. And thank you very much, Mikhail, also for the information you've shared in the chat and the questions that um, uh, that are being asked in the chat. So um, at this point, I would wish to ask, yes, now we are at a good time to take question and answer. That, that will be a very specific and you can feel free as much as possible with Mikhail and with Steve. So uh, just before then, before we give the chance to question and answer, would there be uh, maybe someone who has an experience they would wish to add on what Steve and uh, Mikala said? Maybe you have a unique experience regarding the areas they were talking about. If you could just share that briefly, then we go to question and answer. Um, Gabriel, I'd, I'd like to chime in as well, just on that. Please go ahead. Um, and i'll make it as as personal as possible as it was for me and so probably you can learn from how from what the experience was so what i did is i summarized it into what i wish someone told me before i applied for the scholarships or even during the time that i was applying for the scholarships um so the first one is that sometimes it's really about the finish it's just because you finished that you would actually have the opportunity or the chance to be considered. I know of so many of my friends who start scholarship application process and they don't see it through to the end. 
And you know, this it won't count until you finish. So even if you started six and you didn't finish them, you're not in their database, you're not uh, considered as one of the applicants, so you can be considered. So the most important thing is that when you start, please finish. Um, and I cannot tell you how many times I have seen people who honestly, they, they were so surprised to just have you know received uh, their scholarship offers. They don't think of themselves as really you know well accomplished and, and that and stuff, but they got really good scholarships just because you know probably in the, in the scope in the, in the group that was being considered, they attempted and they were they, they proved to be really good compared to the other applicants because your, the pool is only as good as the people who apply. So always make sure that you finish. Um, and then the second one, I think Steve really emphasized on it, and I probably might have left it out when I began, was having a mentor. If you see a scholarship that, um, that you're interested in and you, you really are not sure about probably how to write the essays ATC, go on LinkedIn, type the name of the scholarship. The name of people who've got the scholarship or who've worked with the scholarship scheme will appear click on them, reach out to those people, especially if they're in your country. It really helps because you have you have a, a communication point and that really helps as well. Um, and and may I also, also talk about the importance of Facebook and WhatsApp when you're applying. So for example, for student scholars, what we did is while we were applying, there was a Facebook group that was formed. And from this Facebook group, people went ahead and further formed their WhatsApp group according to their countries. So if you belong to those groups, they would invite uh, previous scholars of the same scholarships because people have a huge network of other people. So these people would every single day um, tell us what to do, tell us this is what you need to write, this is this is how you need to structure your essay, if you to see. And, and through that, I feel that I was really quite lucky because for me it was the first attempt and I got it at the first attempt and I know people who try four five times and sometimes never get it so it makes a huge difference um, when you're up when you're making your application and then the third one is uh, apply for lots of scholarships don't just target don't just say oh I want to apply for these three and I'm going to focus my energies that's good but sometimes you know when the rejections start coming it beats you really really hard the rejections are real, you guys. You will get rejected, even to that particular scholarship that you thought you were so qualified for. Sometimes it's just maybe the competition was tight, maybe um, the funds were, were much less than they were the previous years, or sometimes it's just that, according to their pool, you probably didn't cut, uh, you didn't make it to the cut. So rejections beat people down. If you want to avoid the, the, the pressure that comes with the rejection, try and, and spread out um, um, how, how many of them you apply for. And for me, I thought that spreading out in terms of numbers was really good, really, really a good strategy to use. So focus on, what, on, on each of them as a, singular, as a singular piece, but just be sure to apply for as many as you can, as you possibly can, or as, as you find interesting. That really makes a difference. Um, and then the other one is, you know, um, coming from Kenya, I know that sometimes you might, you, might, you might not think that that activity you did where you guys, you guys had a community uh, awareness campaign and probably talked about breast cancer for a day is important, but it is very important. So every single experience that you have had in the past that that is probably related to what it is you're doing or that has transferable skills that you would you would say would apply to the course uh, that you intend to take write about it and 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 don't be don't don't um what they call what do they call it don't minimize it um blow well, i would say sort of blow your horn <laughs> not like brag but really really bl blow your horn because you're not you're competing against other people who are speaking about what they have done in depth and they are proud of it and they are not afraid of it and they're not hiding it so um um really make sure that you toot you toot your horn in, in, you know and 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 of course modestly but don't don't be don't be don't minimize yourself shine basically as, as you write your essays shine and write it in a way that makes you shine um, is honest but makes you shine um, and talk about your community what I've learned is 
a number of people who've done amazing things, but mostly that benefits them often don't um, don't get uh, get too far. You might probably get through, you know, oh, this is a brilliant star. Let's bring them in for an interview. And then in the interview, you still just talk about yourself and what it's going to do for you. Um, even if even if sometimes, to be honest, you just feel like um, it's going to help you. Of course, you want to change your life. You want to be able to get an opportunity that's probably going to better your life. But always bring in a community aspect into it. Like, well, how are you, through being empowered, going to empower your community, going to empower um, other people apart from yourself? So make it beyond yourself. For example, I am studying uh, public health, specializing in health economics. And my aim is, you know, because now I'm doing cost effectiveness analysis and Kenya is a lower middle income country with less, less resources on health financing, I would be able to use that knowledge to advise on, on which, which interventions and public health interventions probably by the Ministry of Health or something are, are um, cost effective so that um, the budget is appropriately used. So you see, it's not just for me and, be, and because you're going to get a good salary probably from that, but it's more about the community and who, you're, who, who that kind of knowledge is going to help and the impact and the scale um, of the impact. Um, and then quantify, quantify, quantify. I wish someone told me this, but I, I, I got to learn about this when I applied for YALI. And I don't think the aspect of quantification was emphasized enough in our society and in our community, especially when you're writing an essay, where if, for example, you as a writer have published, has published um, seven books, and these seven books have spoken about this and that. So if you want to talk about it, you can say, always make sure that you quantify that, that, you know, seven books and has, and, and has been read by blah, blah, blah number of people. And I have also made, made my content online and the online content has been accessed by say a hundred people. So always make sure that when you're writing about yourself and what you have done and the work that you have done, always be sure to quantify the impact um you can give numbers you can give outreach you can give um you know uh, if there was an evaluation that was carried out or you can give percentages it has re it has impacted the lives of you know 20 percent following an evaluation that was carried out blah 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 um i'm i'm trying to make it to make it as close at home as possible but there's an attach an importance to quantifying your work and the impact that your work has had um and when you're, I think, I think, I think what, what, what we need to start with as we write our essays, as we put ourselves out there, is that imagine that everybody else who is applying for this is good, very good. And, and, and when you're applying for scholarships like, like, like Chivning, like Fulbright, like Rhodes, uh, uh, or Mandela Rhodes, the applicants of these scholarships have also done things. So you want to make sure that you're standing out. So always have that oomph factor about yourself that you're putting out there. Because if you had a first class honors, everybody else probably did. Somebody even got a first class and went to Dubai and did this and did that. So you want to make sure that it's not only about your academics, just as uh, Steve said, and I just wanted to reiterate this as well, because sometimes you can get caught up in that. But spread your wings, Be uh, look at yourself from a holistic point of view and communicate that um, as, you, as you put yourself out there. Um, and then working with others, just like I said, is through the WhatsApp and the Facebook groups and the LinkedIn, reaching out to people. And most people, by the way, respond. Um, if, you, if you reach out to most people who've had these scholarships and who know the struggle, they will respond to you. And especially if they see you putting in the effort. So you want to make sure that, and, and let me just speak briefly about how you reach out to people. Um, when you reach out to someone, I've had people reach out to me and tell me, hey, write us, write, can you please write an essay for me? I'm like, what? It's, it's, no, it, it's not okay. If you want to reach out to people, show that you're, doing, you're making the effort on your end and be specific about your ask. Like, could you help me review my essay? I'm, target, I'm, I'm writing it towards this uh, kind of scholarship or this or that. So be as specific as possible. And don't want the person to do the work for you. It's, it's a huge turn off, by the way. So um, that, and don't forget your CV. Don't forget 
um, tweaking your CV to, to communicate what you have done also. And um, I think, I think they, I will share a link with you that I saw on, on I think it's Opportunity Desk that had a, a YouTube video explaining how you can put together your CV for, for an application of a, scholar, of, a, of a scholarship. It's slightly different from an academic scholarship and a bit different also from the work scholarship because you add a little bit more details and especially the quantification parts, which sometimes you might not do in, in an academic, uh, um, academic CV scholarship, like if you're looking for a lecturer position or something like that. So it's slightly different. Um, and then what helped me also was I drafted my CV in advance. So what I did is I had this particular CV that I wrote particularly for scholarships. I've been doing that a lot. I do that even now. Like if you want, like if I want to apply for jobs in the field of public health, I would tweak my CV towards public health and make sure that I include everything that I have done in the field of public health and write it down. So if you're targeting for scholarships as well, do the same thing. Draft a CV that you know that um, will only need a little bit of tweaking. But if you have a draft already, it's not difficult for you to apply to so many at the same time. So it isn't your work. And do this also for um, for um, the, the, the personal statements. What we call a personal statement is basically your story. And it also speaks to your desire or your motivation to apply for, for that particular scholarship. So this really helped me. If you have a motivation letter, say for example, you're a publisher or you're a writer and you want to do English literature, but you also think that, you know, well, I, don't, I just don't want to limit myself to English literature. I probably can also think about taking a course in history, you know? So you want to make sure that you have a standard personal statement and then you can tweak it for history. You can tweak it for literature. You can tweak it for, you know, several. So it lessens the amount of, of time that you take to start on each um, on each personal statement. And so it, it enables you to be able to apply to uh, a number of them um, more or less at the same time. And I think what was huge in my, in what I learned of, about my failure over time when applying for scholarships was being organized. So if I applied for seven scholarships last year and they rejected me, I would take note. And I had a book and it's actually this book, notebook. I had a notebook where I wrote them down and I wrote the deadlines. And then on my, on my board, I had, I had written deadlines. In October, I need to look out for one, two, three, four, five, which have a deadline of January. And then, you know, I organized myself like that. So I knew that specifically this week, I'm going to look at this. And next week, I'm going to look at that. And so it, it helps me so much. And then it makes you not forget also the ones that you have started on. Because if you have started, you can note it. Um, and, then, and then you can remind yourself all the time before the deadline so that you get to finish and finish well. So that really helped. Um, having it literally written down really, really, really helps a lot. And mark the deadlines. Because sometimes you can miss a deadline. And it's, it's really painful. When, when you were preparing for it, you take time and work on it, and then you miss the deadline by a couple of hours. It's really painful. So just make sure that you're, um, you're on time. And, and, and it's always better to, you know, if you can try and finish earlier and then submit it earlier, the better for you as well. Um, and then I think what, what uh, Steve didn't mention, but also slightly mentioned a bit, was engaging in competitions that make you visible. So, uh, for example, I was a Yali Fellow. I have been a Fellow, uh, Africa Changemakers Fellow. Um, um, I was a student leader in my uni. Um, I was a student leader in high school and throughout, uh, basically throughout my life. Um, so small, small um, leadership opportunities here and there, small, small um, um, like if you're, if, you're, if you're a president of a writer's club or if you established your own club and you are mentoring a number of people, do that, write it down. So, and, and then there's always, you know, all these competitions, Commonwealth competition, writers competition, uh, Queens writers competition, One Young World writers competition. So things like that, that would um, give you visibility is really important because it sets you aside also um, from just other people who are just applying and sort of trying out and they haven't really attempted to, to, to get there as well. So that, that's just to add to your portfolio. 
Um, and then the importance of recommenders, having recommenders in time. So what happens is you want to reach out to people who will vouch for you. And they will not only vouch for you uh, by word of mouth, but they will write about you in a very intimate way. Um, I'm happy to share one of, one of, my, one of my recommendations. Uh, of course, I will change a few things because I don't want the names of those people to appear. But yes, there is a way you can draft your recommendation letter. The way that we do it in Kenya is not okay. You know the way they say, I know this person, she was here within this duration of time and this, this. It doesn't help, guys. Put pressure on your recommenders and make sure they make it personal. Where they say, Mikal, um, say for example, Mikal was, was uh, hardworking and this was, and show evidence of, of your hard work. This was evidence through, you know, the project that she managed. We, we tasked her with, with writing regional uh, health, health data reports and she, and she, very well executed that, something like that. So speak about a trait, um, encourage your recommenders to speak about a trait, and then give evidence of how it worked, how, how you particularly um, attained that trait. So how we do it is not really useful. Um, and uh, I'm happy to actually share a couple of, of that. I think Gabriel, you can remind me about that as well, so that we yeah. just see samples of how our recommenders can recommend us in a way that is suitable. Um, and reach out to them earlier because some of them will disappoint you last minute, I'm telling you. You will, you will tell them that, you know, I want you to recommend me, but what I did which really helped was I drafted the letters on my own. So I drafted my own recommend recommendation letters and I sent it to them for their approval. So they would edit it or add something or whatever, but put your own voice if it's possible. And then usually what we mistake is we think that our recommenders have to be like professors or this big, you know, big names. It doesn't matter if it's a big name that doesn't speak very well about you. It's even actually better to have just someone who can attest to your work vastly rather than have a big name that will, will not speak much about you because the interest is in you and what you have done and how you meet particular, particular um, um, targets or criteria or, or qualities. And the person who speaks the most, the best about that gets ahead much, much faster than someone who just has a big name with no, not many words. Um, and then, um, I, as I've mentioned, the specific format for recommendation letters is very different. So is the specific format for, for those of you who are still in uni. There's a, a format for, um, for transcript. Your transcript has to just, uh, just make sure that it has an explanation of grades. Usually sometimes we leave it out. Um, you can request in a number of unis, you can request and then they can add an additional um, explanation and you attach it to your transcript. So when you, when, you, when you scan your transcript, scan it into one single PDF that has that um, as part of the transcript so that it's easy to understand, especially for, for those targeting um, maybe you know, high level institutions. Um, it's really, really important and they lay emphasis on that so much. Um, and then, like I said, guys, you're going to be rejected. It's hard, it's difficult you're going to be beat down and you will doubt yourself. And, and it's, it's really sad when you put in a lot of effort and you're rejected, but such is life and you don't give up, you keep moving. You keep moving until somebody, until somebody accepts um, um, you and what you want. And if, it's, if you really, really wanted the institution, try again, there's never any harm. But what I'd say is you'd rather have tried than not tried because if they rejected you, you can try again elsewhere. You can know that, you know, probably I didn't meet their criteria now, but I might later, or I might meet the, um, the requirements of another institution much later. Um, and then assess yourself and where you come from. And, and when you're making the decision or the choice about where you're going to study, make it more personal to you. For example, I have always known that I'm really ambitious. I want to be in a place, in a space, where um, my skills are appreciated, where I can actually speak to people so, and, 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 and they understand me and have friends. And, and I was very particular about a place with a higher currency because, you know, you know, <laughs> so that was really important to me. <laughs> um, so think about yourself as well.
you you probably can get a scholarship to go to a country um but the currency is not as high but if it's not a problem for you and you just want to go to a school move from where you are and it's much better probably than where you come from and you're thinking about you know it's just better than that and so i'd rather stick with this until i find something better that's good but if you can go for the best i always say if you can go for the very best when i was picking public health i knew that i was going for an ivy league school right from the word go i knew that this is the institution that is the best and most recognized for this course and that's what i want because i don't want to 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 spend a year of my life and then probably go back home and 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 feel like it's not recognized so if that's important to you think about it because it's ta- it's your time that you're spending um and make sure that it satisfies you as well as an individual and with your goals so thank you that's what i wanted to share i'm i'm going to share more of course with uh, the coming questions be as raw and as authentic and as honest as possible ask all the stupid questions that you would like to be answered thank you steve and uh and gabriel it's sorry i just saw steve there so yeah mm-hmm. thank you very much mikal eh? you put it very uh clearly eh? and thank you for the preparation you made for this and the willingness to share some of the mistakes you've made some 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 of the ideas you've shared have really struck me eh? like uh in in many cases we always look for big names to recommend us eh? but you said it doesn't matter if it's a big name but don't speak so well of you eh? so it's even better to go for that person who can uh, talk generously about you mm-hmm. that was a very key point that you've mentioned and your last point which i <laughs> i feel should have come first eh? if you can't go for the best and i know for sure you've always looked for the best uh, and you keep pursuing the best and eh? sometimes we fall too short of what we could have uh, gotten thank you very much for those very clear and very actionable uh, and uh, possibly easy to implement ideas regarding uh, pursuing scholarships and opportunities that are around us yeah i i, I was writing and i feel uh two pages already yeah so <laughs> that is uh that 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 is how beneficial i find the session to be i don't know if that is shared by anyone in the audience maybe you can be able to share a question and input uh i saw cody had something to add please you may go ahead ah this I'm is not millicent. Cody. <laughs> it's millicent i'm using my husband's phone sorry Ah, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> so anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was roommate with Mik- Mik- Mikhail first oh, year. I don't know if she can remember. Unani kumbuka? Anyway, uh, so <laughs> I'm studying in the US and I decided to switch from PhD to master's, but I just wanted to people to know that um, for the US, you don't have to have master's. You can get enrolled directly for PhD. And alternatively, I know uh, Steve and uh, Mikhail have talked about um, re- uh, scholarships, but alternatively, another source of funding is research assistantship. So, for example, how I, I was working through is you get recruited into a professor who has already looked for money, and what you do is you work for them. So your research, what you're doing is you're working for them, and that, that is what you're phd is all about and also that's how you get paid and that's how they pay for your tuition so i just wanted to let people know that there's also an alternative source of funding and it's not always about scholarships and that one is usually more preferable for people who want to pursue phd's uh because they know that you are there for four or five years so their investment is you is not like masters one year or two years and you're out so yeah just like that i think the rest they've talked about so yeah mm-hmm. thank you very much millicent so good to see you here and uh when i if i saw the picture I would have not kept calling you cody yeah <laughs> but thank you very much for showing us the picture i can remember you very well from ku i do as well i remember you oh my god hello <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay steve uh, and any other person do you have anyone who has something to add on that before we go full blast to question and answer maybe an idea may have come to you in the process of all this 
I, I think we'll be able to answer, uh, I mean, uh, more, more points will come through when people ask questions. And I would encourage everyone to, to ask as, you know, just as Mikhail said, as silly questions as you can, anything is, uh, is answerable. Um, yeah. Perfect, yes. So let's, I see Boniface again is ready to ask a question so you can proceed. I'm not exactly asking a question though. Uh, I want to add to the conversation. Yeah. Uh, so let me say thank you to to Mika. I hope that's the, the right pronunciation of the name and Stephen for obviously taking time to talk to us about this very important you know, tips they're giving us. So I'm also looking for, for a path into, into education and master, uh, masters and all that. Uh, but let me say, um, I, I, I work for a MasterCard Foundation project and Restless Development Uganda. And what I've seen, and some of you mentioned it, is that actually sometimes they consider people in the people who actually applied for staff already. Like the the the, the um a project we are, we are working on is not the youth think tank. And the recent cohort are uh, actually choose from from the people who already applied. And so you're just going to find people there, they're, they're, they're in the new cohort, you don't know where they came from, you didn't see the, the advertisement for that, but they, they just went straight to, to the emails you guys sent, some of you are rejected, and then they tell you, uh, will, you be will you want to be considered for this position? So applying for things is very important, and that's just something I want to add to the conversation as well, and also volunteering. I've seen that even the, in the small research that I've done, I have seen that actually a lot of people have gotten into positions or even doing well in, in terms of business because of the research you're doing on, they, they volunteered with an organization or something. So people don't want to, to do work for free, but volunteering opens, opens so many opportunities to you, so many networks. And therefore, I think it's very important for us to rethink on, on, on what you call free work. You don't want to work for someone for free. You know, um, the opportunities you're going to get, man, they, 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 they're, so, they're so amazing and they connect you to, to better things. And, so, and therefore, volunteering is also an opportunity that can actually give you a scholarship and some other things that we are talking about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I thank you very much, Banasagini, for the input. I um, think uh, Michelle, Michael mentioned it, uh, mentioned it at some point, and also Steve, and you've added on to it. That just shows how important it is to volunteer and to document and to, I think it talks a lot about you in terms of how you take the opportunity and how it can benefit others. So thank you very much for that, Sagini. Uh, Michael, I see you have, you, would you wish to speak? No? Yes, um, I just I, I think I left out the importance of of uh, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. the use of LinkedIn as as a professional website just to put yourself out there and speak about what you have done. It's a really important one because if I see you, the first thing I'm going to do is Google you or find you on LinkedIn and sort of go through your profile and see if it's accurate or not. And this usually goes for the not so known scholarships there are some institutions that have um scholarships maybe for two or three people so they're not going to be as big so if they're looking for people to take in they they will prioritize what they see about you and what has been spoken about you so just make sure that you have that other aspect of you in order as well and especially because we are writers your profiles your portfolios your blogs your your the links to your work the work that you have done before make sure that you also include it there just so that people can see. It gives you that edge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the, that addition on, this, on, the, on putting yourself out there. Uh, any, any, any question now? Now let's start the questions. And uh, maybe you could, I could ask everyone. Eh? So I would start with Mugeni, as it appears to me here. So I'll just, if you have any question or any input on the same. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Mikhail even for 
such a wonderful session. I've learned a lot and I've taken quite a number of notes. And um, I have a couple of stupid, actually very stupid questions. Uh, and uh, thank you for stupid questions. And uh, I don't know if I should ask all of them together or I ask one, someone else, so that I don't take a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, I don't take opportunities for other people to ask questions. Gabriel, you'll direct me again. I have like uh, about four questions. Four different Just questions. ask all of them, then we'll be able to take three, then they, uh, they answer, then we take another bunch of three. So just ask all of them. They'll take notes. Yeah. Uh, this is quite off. Uh, as I said, it's uh, very stupid, uh, not exactly related to the main things uh, you've talked about, but uh, it's a bit of what you've been, you had mentioned. So for me, for Mikhail, um, she had said that uh, before the United King Kingdom pulled out of uh, uh, the European Union, uh, there were opportunities to travel across uh, the different uh, nations that make the, uh, the EU. Now, especially for someone who would want to, to, to visit uh, the UK, but at the same time visit all other uh, na closed nations in the EU. How would someone go about it? Um, would you like for me to answer straight away or would you like for him to ask all of them first, Gabriel? Uh, I would wish that he can be able to ask the four, then okay. we'll be able to answer them once, yeah. All right, no worries, yeah. Uh, Mugeni, you may proceed. Yeah, sure. On the same note, Stephen had uh, mentioned that um, from from what he has been doing, there are quite uh, he has also come across uh, travel opportunities. Uh, if I can also, again, on the same uh, note, uh, just briefly uh, tell us uh, how easy is it for someone to about uh, visiting and traveling around where he has traveled to. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, someone can do? Um, Mikhail had uh, mentioned that there are also job opportunities in, uh, uh, in the UK where she is, apart from the many scholarship opportunities. So, uh, someone who is outside the UK, let's say someone is in Kenya, or he knows someone in Kenya who would love to, to seek for opportunities, what are the channels and uh, what are the do's and don'ts for one to learn to some of those opportunities over there? Okay. My, my last question. Uh, I think this uh, goes for both. Mm. Uh, we, um, from my understanding, during the session is that both of you are in, in masters. Uh, you are postgraduate studies. Uh, what plans do you have after there? Are you uh, are you planning to come back uh, to Kenya, or you'll now uh, start working uh, from there, from your respective uh, places? Okay. Well, those are the questions I had. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Mugeni. So let me, let's me let just take one more from Karen Wairimu, then we'll get the answers to those, then we we'll proceed. Uh, so Karen, if you have any questions or any input, you may unmute and ask. Okay. June? June? Okay. Karen is here. Please go ahead. Um. For now, I don't have a question for me, but I would like to say that it's been really eye-opening, um, especially in your application where you have to really personalize your experience instead of saying, well, maybe, Karen, maybe Karen, you may speak closer to your earphone with your mic. Oh, okay. Can yes. you hear me? Now? That's better. Yes, yes. Okay, I was saying um, it's been a really eye-opening experience. I've gotten to learn a lot, especially about personalizing uh, your resume and your application. Uh, yeah. Like where you were saying about leadership, you don't just say, I'm a leader here. You can say, with or under my leadership, we were able to accomplish, you know, this number of, um, yeah, this number of something, something. So um, thank you. I've really learned so much from this space. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, Karen. Uh, now that you didn't have a question, I would give chance to June and Julie if you have any question. June. Okay. 
so we can rest. Okay, June, please. I can see you are here now. Yes, June. Yes. Yes, June. Do you have any question? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm saying this is Julie. Yes, yes, Julie. Yeah, it's glad. Uh, we are glad be, uh, being told. So I've tried applying for uh, for scholarships scholarship since 2014, and the closest I got is uh, we got a partial, partial scholarship. scholarship. So and the amount was uh, the amount was supposed to pay was too high. high. So we just decided to. So we decided to just finish the undergraduate in Kenya. So I was asking if there are really something like full scholarship, like full, uh, they pay everything, everything. Accommodation. Yeah. And, okay. and we have learned. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I hope you captured it well, Mikal. I was not able to capture it. And also Steve. So then you may respond to that. I'll first uh, give chance to Mikal. If you can remember the questions by Mugeni and uh, the last question by June. I do, yeah, I do. Uh, he asked if it's still possible to travel. Of course it is. I mean, of course it is. It's, uh, we are really not sure about how the Brexit issue is going to turn out, um, considering the economic frustration that a lot of the countries are experiencing at the moment. But um, what happens is, like like for me, I would be able to go to Switzerland if I wanted to now. I'd be able to go to all these countries. So long as their borders are open, well, following the COVID uh, situation that we had, you can very easily travel. So that, and, and it's also what I, I thought was quite different was it's, it's quite affordable actually to travel across to these um, other countries. Um, and I think it's still possible to do that. Only probably things would change a little bit because... Um, with with the UK moving away from 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 EU, then that would mean that um, they'd be different. So there probably would be need to apply for a permit to go into the EU countries. But the EU, you know, still remains a block. So it's just the UK that's different. So actually, it's them who are probably more more disadvantaged because they all, all the different countries they have to apply to come to the UK. But for UK, you apply only once and you go to all the other countries. So basically, they still have an upper hand. Um, and if you're considering applying to UK and even the EU countries, it wouldn't be such a huge disadvantage, to be honest, actually thinking about it. And I, and I don't know if this is something that's being emphasized back home now. So the UK has just introduced um, a work permit for graduates starting next year. So anyone who's coming in the class of 2021, from summer of 2021, anyone who graduates then will be able to have a two-year work visa that's guaranteed so long as you're a student here. So that means even you who's coming from Kenya, if you don't have a, a scholarship that restricts you towards going back home, you can stay here and look for work and work. Um, and that's really good. So also that would help you decide, um, especially regarding the kind of scholarship that you want be very be very um, be very informed about it. For example, Chivning is a prestigious scholarship. It's really good and and it gives you a decent stipend and all. However, you have to go back home at the end of your studies. Um, but if you're looking probably to work uh, to stay and probably work, then you probably want to consider probably other avenues because for this one it's binding that you have to go back. But if you have, there are other scholarships like Open Society Foundation, um, Ofid Scholarship, um, the, different, the different scholarships offered by the individual departments of the unis that you will be applying to that do not really restrict you that much. So be very um, open-minded about how you're applying and the approach you want to have. If you want to go back home, probably you have a job already, you're more established by all means. Um, but if you intend to stay, also look at that. And, and when you're looking at the scholarship and that's something that is important to you, go through the terms and conditions and look at what does the scholarship require of me. That's, uh, that's really important to note as well. Um, 
And yes, the job opportunities are available even for people who are from abroad, from countries abroad. However, what I've seen is it's, um, it's limited. I'll be very honest with you. It's limited, especially if you're there and not here. However, uh, avenues that you can look into exploring include one, the arts, like you guys are in the arts, you're writing, you're publishing, you're poets, you're artists. Basically, you have an advantage of exchange. So if you're looking to come uh, focus a little bit more also on the, on the potential opportunities of exchange programs, artists with artists, institutions like the Kenya National Theatre with, with the British um, opera or musical or whatever, so that would be a really good uh, opportunity as well. Um, however, what I've seen is there are also opportunities with PhDs, but like I mentioned, they are quite limited and, and most of them are open to home or EU, home or EU. So sometimes it gets really frustrating to look for, to look for when, you, when you're looking for those. And they come, yes, but it comes after a struggle. So they are really quite limited, but I know if you if you were working like right now for guys who have, I'm sure this is a mixed audience. Probably I should have found, I should have done a better job of finding out what the audience here is like. But for people who have work experience, like you have three, four, five years of work experience, it would suit you more if if um, if you applied directly and just came in and and worked because of the work experience that you have, especially if it's a technical area. So you might want to look also at the different countries have different shortage occupations that they have listed. So for example, if you're interested in going to Australia, because Australia is actually one of the really fantastic countries where after work, you can, uh, they give you a, a postgraduate work permit and you can stay and work uh, if, if you wish. So if you're, if, you're looking, if you're looking in that direction, look at the shortage, the, the shortage occupational skills, which ones are related to what you're doing that you could go and do that would put you in that list and then give you an advantage. I think nobody really tells you these things. It takes um, looking deeply and having insights for you to be able to actually see how, strat how strategically you can position yourself from the beginning so that you can take advantage of the opportunities that are available. Um, um, someone asked about our plans for postgraduate studies. I think Steve should start on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Steve should go first. Okay, Mika, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think I'll just pick it from where Mika uh, talked about, uh, you know, looking at opportunities after after graduation. Um, so currently actually like for uh which month are we in we're in june yeah. yeah so from last month i i started an internship in one of the global consulting organization uh, uh based in based in canada and um for me i'm looking at it as a as a way of fishing uh fishing since the organization doesn't have any operations in africa in terms of uh uh, okay, well, it, it only ha it has a couple of projects that it's done before, but currently it doesn't have anything going on. So I'm looking at fishing the global consulting organization and sort of taking advantage of my internship period to probably apply for funding from the government of Canada and take the projects back home. So that's, that's my sort of grand plan with just getting into this organization. So, I mean, people have different goals. Um, individuals some want to stay abroad uh, some want to fish and get uh, things back to the continent i think it all depends on the on the on your on your personal on on your personal objectives uh, so it cuts across you can either decide to work here uh, where i would say honestly the opportunities are kind of limited in a way for, for especially for international students um, so if you really uh, like, uh, I don't know, to inclined towards uh, towards the develop, development of the continent, um, I would say it's good. It's it's always good to go get that knowledge and find a way of getting some of these organizations establish uh, so, sort of working relationships with the with the continent, whether uh, whether it's from a funding perspective or 
project perspective, and most of them are always willing to do this because they look at you as a trusted um, as a trusted partner or someone who has gone through their their system and who understands their system and who they can trust with their projects if uh, if they were to to bring in into the continent. So uh, th those are the avenues I'm exploring. Uh, but as I said, uh, it's usually a very personal journey. Others come here and get married. Others come here and you know establish families. So I don't know what Mikal plans to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's quite Okay, perfect. I'll share mine then. Um, <laughs> for me, I still have a couple of months to go if I choose. Um, but I think for me at this point, because chipping restricts you and you have to go back home. So they literally book your flight for you. Um, and I'm sure they'll, they'll be sending the emails very soon. However, meanwhile, I... Um, I have a, I'm working remotely, and most recently I signed a contract with the WHO, um, and it, it was a short consultancy contract. And I'm looking up, I'm looking forward to taking it up. Um, but apart from that, I definitely would come back home. Um, still looking into potential PhD opportunities um, and international work because I have worked with a number of UN organizations before and so this would just be me trying to stretch um, extras but I think meanwhile I have missed my daughter and I just want to come back home as well just to be with her yeah um, and someone asked about about scholarships um, so moving forward I think I think looking at just trying to project and see the future of fully funded scholarships, they are going to dwindle. As I, th I think I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, but what I'm trying to do is prepare us for the, for the type of competition that is ahead. Um, the EU, if the EU, and this is just my own personal analysis, if the EU moves away from, from the UK, like Brexit happens officially and it's official, it means that EU students are going to be international students, especially for those who are looking to come into UK. EU students are going to be considered as international students here. Okay, so what that means is that the some of the scholarships that were initially just only targeting particular continents will probably have to stretch to accommodate some of them as well, in my opinion. And so the competition only toughens and fewer sports are gonna be left. Um, so that means that we, we, we've got to tighten up our belts. But it could also mean that they could better their, their education systems in such a way that it would be easily accessible for those of us who want to come from different countries, like especially from the African continent, and, and study here. So um, it's different. Though, just look at it from the different perspectives. And I know I completely understand how frustrating partial scholarships are, especially if you cannot pay the other half. So the idea is, ask yourself, how bad do you want it? Do you want it so bad that despite getting the half, you're still willing to um, continue applying or you want to stop? But also, I think what's not, what we are not told enough is that sometimes you can get a partial scholarship from the institution, but there are partner institutions or uh, foundations. I think we haven't been told much about find foundations that take in um, requests for partial funding. They are there. If you if you look it up, you'll see a lot of them come up, um, and and you can put through your your request for the funds so that the amount of money that you're left to pay is not as much as what you obviously wouldn't pay if if you were to pay the whole of the half or the partial yourself. So that's an avenue that you might consider exploring. Next time you get a partial scholarship, look into what are the other options that you could use that are available that could fill the gap so that it, it, it makes the, the burden much lighter for you if you really want to go to that school. Because I know someone who got admission into Oxford and they had partial scholarship into Oxford, which is, which is a really good institution and sometimes often difficult to get into. So what they did is they fundraised and and then approached organizations and approached a corporate organization. I think it was Safaricom or KPLC. And they were offered something 
uh, they were offered something by those organizations. They took help loans and all these things. And now he graduated and he went back home and he got a really, 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 really good job. Um, so sometimes taking that extra step might also pay off. The idea is just not to give up entirely. But if it doesn't work for you, you could always try again. Just be a little organized around finding uh, the, full, the fully funded ones. But I think one thing that is important when looking into scholarships is the timing. The timing is really important because once the deadline elapses, you have to wait until next year. So you want to make sure that as you are applying now, you're thinking through the time make sure that you have the time in mind so that it doesn't pass you. Because sometimes you might find that the cohort of applicants for this year might probably not be as big. Many people probably didn't know about the time and they missed it or they started and forgot. And, and so it's a few people and all those people are taken in because they don't have other options, you know, and they're looking to meet a certain quota. So yeah, usually think about the time, really, really emphasize on the time as you continue with your applications. Thanks, Gab. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mikhail. I can hear you. You've spoken until you need some more time. Ah, Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. okay. Gabriel, uh, if I if I yeah. may interrupt. Please go um, ahead. I think uh, I think it's Mogeni who asked about uh, travel opportunities um, mm. within the within the EU region when you're doing your studies, maybe. Um, yeah. I think what, from my personal experience, one thing I did uh, in the summer of uh, 2019 was uh, something they call summer school. So these are usually short courses or uh, short uh, short programs where you go uh, to maybe an institution or an organization and you you either trained on a specific uh, a specific program. For for in my case, I was being trained on how to design smart cities and uh, that was fully funded by my university and that was a whole different grant so so these uh these uh, most of these universities abroad have some departmental funding for some of these uh small travel opportunities so it's it's, it's about you getting into into an institution and asking questions pursuing some of these opportunities because i think out of my class of 17 people it's only it's only it's only three of us who got that funding, and it's just because we applied. Others, others opted not to apply. So, uh, so even when you get some of these opportunities, you don't relax. You don't say that Nimepata or oh, I've got this scholarship. Uh, this is the end of it. No, uh, you just go a step ahead to 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 keep on asking locally. Uh, you know, local organizations or local departments within your university, uh, whether they have this sort of funding uh, to to finance the regional opportunities. Uh, the other thing is, f some of these regional opportunities are never advertised uh, within the school. So it's all about you going out again uh, to sites, uh, asking people, okay, if I wanted to do this, where can I get this? And they are always, websites which have specific uh, information on 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 some of these opportunities so uh, like opportunity desk is one of the one of the sites that i i really make use of it has fellowships short programs it might be just one week but it can turn around a lot because uh, for me every every travel opportunity i've had it has led to another so it's more of like a chain because uh, of the networks that you build from every encounter. So I would, I would encourage you, even when you're still in Kenya or whichever country you are in at the moment, try to try to look for local opportunities because one always leads to another, as opposed to waiting for that grand moment. Yeah, I think that's it uh, from me, Gabriel. Thank you very much, Steve, for that addition. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. And because the, I see our time is already up, I would not wish to go as I was going to ask everyone. So I, I'll just ask anyone who has a question. The, the, maybe three questions, then we'll, uh, we'll be able to guide you further from there. Nishama? Yes, Gabriel. 
I yes. think I'm also going to ask for a second uh, edition of this fishing abroad. But I have two questions. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, how full is the full scholarship or how partial is the partial scholarship? Does it include accommodation or does it only go to the extent of academics? Then the next question is what Stephen was talking about, about uh, eating. What kind of yeah. essays was he talking about? Is it the is it uh, fictional stuff, or they must be academic, or any other thing? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't. I see Mikal. You are struggling to get the, the last question, but I think he, you mentioned essays which you are asked when you are applying uh, yeah. for these opportunities. So I think Elishama is asking whether those essays are fictional or academic, if I got it right. Huh? Um, okay, Fanon, I see you have a question. You may proceed. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I hope you can hear me uh, well. Yes, we can. I can. Okay, so the first question is, uh, so there are some areas which are growing and shrinking, like uh, during this uh, COVID, we find uh, sectors like uh, the one Mikal is doing, you know, the health economics, the masters in that seems viable according to the, to the changing times. So which, uh, what advice would you give about the courses, you know, uh, especially those courses revolving around uh, policy? Maybe you can shed more light. Uh, the other question I have is uh, about the, the, the mode of teaching. So are most courses, especially masters uh, uh, courses, being done in terms of coursework, first, then dissertation next. Then my last question is, uh, uh, now that we have the digital space, uh, we have, uh, is it, um, what are the advantages of doing maybe the, 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 the postgraduate uh, course online, uh, rather than actually going there to do it uh, uh, full time? Yeah, so yeah, those are my question. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Fanon. We'll take one more, then we give uh, Mikhail and Steve a chance to respond. Oh, hello. I had left a question in the chat box. Ah, sorry, 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 Karen. Um, well, please go ahead, go ahead and ask. Eh? Or it, uh, it's, it's better to hear it from you than when I read it. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, so since you will be living in the, like when you're living abroad, you know, you're not just going to school and class, there's also the environment around you. So like, did you experience any form of racial discrimination? Uh, if yes, how did you deal with it? I know this is a bit out of topic, but uh, it's also good to know since uh, if you go abroad, you will be staying there. Thank you. Um, so you can respond to those, and as usual, ladies first. So, Mikal. <laughs> Gabriel, I see what you did there. Right. I will begin with um, the question and the essays. I, I, I don't know if my screen is fine, but I feel like my face is half on the screen. Not sure. Uh, no, no, it's fine. Yeah. Eh? Okay. We can okay. see you. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so most of the essays that you're going to be asked about are your personal experiences, like, for example, the chimney essays, just to give you an example from that. Um, there were questions on, on your leadership experience, um, on what you intend to do once you you know once once what's your what what do you want to do in the next five years where do you see yourself what's your long-term plan things like those so most of them are very personal and it's an attempt to get to know you as an individual and what value you're going to add through the education that you you get exposed to so I'm, i haven't really had a chance to see unless you're playing for undergraduate i remember when i used to do the sats for the US, a lot of, but most of them were very personal. It was more my story. Why am I applying for that particular um, uh, course that I'm applying for? 
and and it was more about me. I, I felt that the the questions were more geared towards me talking about my experiences and how they have shaped my 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 wanting to pursue that course and in that particular country. So a lot of them would also ask you, why did you particularly choose the UK um, and not other countries? So if it's not something that's very personal to you, because everybody else can say, oh, UK is a beautiful country. Okay, so is uh, so is um, so is Switzerland, so is uh, South Africa, you know, so is Kenya. So why not study there? So if you bring in a personal aspect, I I thought that is what made you stand out better. Uh, so most of them make it as personal as you can and discuss how your personal um, experiences in the past or professional experiences have shaped your desire to pursue whatever course it is you want to pursue. Um, and the question on partial scholarships, often partial scholarships would give you partial scholarship for tuition. It could be full tuition and no accommodation, no living stipend. Uh, or sometimes it could be 50% uh, of tuition, so you cover the other 50 uh, of tuition and and usually the tuition fees is is, is the one that that's that's heavy and the living the living cost of of that particular country that you're going to for example i'm in london london is one of the most expensive cities in the world and so if you have a partial scholarship that only probably covers your tuition and doesn't cover your accommodation and your stipend in London, you might struggle a little, uh, and 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 you know you don't immediately land and have a job. That's that's also just to be to be really quite frank with you. So a lot of people will tell you, "Oh, take it up," and then you're gonna you're gonna work and and fill it up. Think very carefully about it before you go for such a decision because it's really strenuous um, on an individual. So most of them, though, don't give you the living stipend. And that's as important as the tuition because of the focus you'll have in school. But I've seen a couple of uh, Indian students and, and students from other EU countries, though there are advantages because of the, of the status of their countries, which is still EU, they're able to, they have access to some jobs that you probably don't. And their visa type is different. So because I'm on tier four visa, I'm limited to working 20 hours a week unless it's holidays or like now there's coronavirus. So the, the government literally just dropped um, their requirement for people to work 20 hours a week. So it means you can work 40 or 50, whatever, if you want. Um, but then the catch is in the scarcity of the kind of work because a lot of them were closed down. So you, you can see how to strike a balance. Um, it's more or less the same here for... The, 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 the kind of arrangement we have where we have the coursework first and then the dissertation. So for me, we have done a, a lot of the coursework, though a lot of the exams, some of them have been pushed into September and a couple in October. But now we are doing our thesis, uh, the dissertation work within this time and, and September. So it, usually it's more or less the same format. Yeah. Um, and someone asked about about you know with with increased digital availability of courses if it's better to take the courses online or if it's better for you to be present um through a face-to-face -face program i think it depends on what you're looking to get from the program like for me i was looking to get out of the kenyan environment and so a face-to-face -face program would be very suitable for me I was looking to experience something new, a different environment, a new culture, um, a new people, probably new friends. And I've had the opportunity to make really good friends here as well. So it depends. But I know for sure that if you're pursuing an online program, it's definitely not going to be as, as uh, expensive as a face-to-face -face in terms of cost. So that's a really good thing for someone who's looking... Um, for, for scholarships and probably just lands into part-time and not full-time. Usually you're able to just email the school and tell them that you'd like to change the focus to be more online and not in person. And it, it cuts down on the cost that you would, you would uh, be expected to, to pay for in, uh, compared to having a face-to-face -face program. But for me, I was looking to make the networks. I was looking to do the traveling. I was looking to meet to the professors because a lot of the professors in my uni have authored the books that I've read throughout my life. 
and it was such an honor to just sit down with them and them listening to my ideas and you know talking to them and it, yeah so if that is something you value then you probably want to go the face to face way but if that's not too important you're okay with having them teach you online um though they try to make it interactive usually across different unis so you will benefit from that as well it's not too bad especially if you already have work in Kenya if you have work in Kenya that is stable and you like it and you want to continue working and you don't want to sacrifice your work for a different place maybe if you leave your work they would replace you and you wouldn't have a contract and you value your work and that's where you see yourself working probably in the next 2 3 years or something then you can consider staying online um because of the value that you get from your work as well uh but for me face to face is what worked and i've really i've tremendously enjoyed it and as much as it was a short experience because coronavirus came in i think in the beginning of mid january there about and so yeah it shortened the experience for us but hopefully things will open up and then we'll we'll catch up um and and then the question on racial discrimination uh to be quite frank i haven't i haven't really very vaguely experienced racism i have mildly in an instance i think the uk is is i think one of the most accommodating countries i have traveled to and and i would say i'm i'm a bit well traveled so the uk is is one of those that i would say they're not you know like it's it's not overt they will not someone will not shout you monkey or something like that but um probably you might you know the slight difference in the treatment but it's very mild i can't say that it would bother me or probably it's just because i'm just like i don't care so i don't even i i'm not even sensitive to it at all but to be quite frank i really haven't experienced any kind of overt racism however i have classmates who have said that I, they have noticed a slight difference in how the professor treats them when they have the face to face personal online consultation rather than the other people who are not um like us who who have the same so i i personally haven't but they probably have in a very overt but slight slight way it's not loud so that's better anyway because you don't want it to be loud anyway yeah i think steve can talk about canada canada probably has a different experience um so still uh, are, are you asking on the issue of racism yeah okay. or, or you could just uh, begin probably with the questions that they asked and how it applies to canada okay maybe i could i could start with the uh, with i think it's el shama yeah mm -hmm. uh where he asked about uh, how pasho is pasho and whether s is a uh, fictional or academic um so so i think i think with pasho scholarship i always say it's it's good to tread carefully on on those uh pasho scholarship offers because i've seen people get that and then they end up in universities and str they struggle because if the uni is only paying for your tuition it means then you'll have to come and work to uh to finance your your rent and accommodation and life is expensive honestly uh sometimes i see people working for so many hours and by the time they are coming to do their classes you you wouldn't even want to look at them i mean they are they are overly exhausted so so it's always good to handle the partial scholarships with care uh don't just be rush uh especially when there's an opportunity to get full scholarship so i would rather work hard on my on my applications for full scholarship than uh than uh, going through the hassle but then it all depends on uh, on the perspectives but I, i would go for for full scholarship then on the essays um i i'm not so sure about uh, i'm not so sure about this uh, what do you call it this framework but uh, i would try to put it in a layman's language i'm i'm bit i'm a bit careful cuz i'm speaking to writers so and i wasn't a good writer so so i want i want to be be careful on how i handle these words but uh generally the essays are, are more about speaking what you've done speaking about yourself and 
sort of unpacking yourself. Uh, um, I'm looking at if it's Elishama, who is Elishama when we get to leadership? Who is Elishama when we get to career aspirations? Uh, who is Elishama uh, in the context of the cost that he is applying for? So, so it's more of about expressing yourself through through the essays, and also sometimes uh, they would ask about a particular topic. They want to see your your thoughts within the topic and how you you see yourself in the topic. So uh, it depends. This this essays kind of cut across, and that's why I said uh, it's always good to look out for people who've gone through the program because they understand. Uh, the best way uh, of answering those uh, those essay questions. So, um, as I said, don't do it blindly. Uh, reach out to people. Uh, I get Mikal and I and any other alumni of any of these programs would be willing to take you through the journey. Then, um, I think Fanon asked about the growing and uh, shrinking courses and uh, how post-COVID times look like for, for some of these courses. Uh, for some courses and whether we are going to get like some getting more demand and others uh, getting lesser demand or something. Um, I think, uh, and I always, I always look at this in a, in a, in a very open minded way. Uh, sometimes when you're going for these courses, it's not more about the cost, but the, 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 the um, what you get within within the context. Um, take for example, I've I did my I did my MSc in urban planning, and now I'm doing a, a master of public policy. So for me, when I went for the uh, urban planning course, um, I didn't have any background in uh, you know architecture or urban design or anything to do with planning cities. But I just decided to get into it and just get the whole experience of what it takes to plan cities, how, what it takes to design cities. And through the journey, I came to appreciate that uh, actually Africa has a policy gap, as a policy gap when, when it comes to planning and developing cities. So uh, as I was stepping out now to get into the public policy course, I was very clear that um, I'll be doing public policy in the context of understanding how I can use my public policy skills in the, in the planning of cities or in the designing of, of cities or in the thinking of uh, the future of cities. So, um, so I, think, I think I would look at courses as enablers rather than uh, whether I'll get an opportunity through this course or not. Because we've seen uh, people getting to institutions like World Bank, where they had a background in uh, in a, in a, in a, in a irrelevant course. So it's all about it's all about how you how you ut utilize the the time that you're in your master's program, the research skills that you get, and trying to see how you can apply them in different contexts. Because uh, we are we are moving to more of a, a skills. Uh, sort of a skills based uh, skills based uh, uh, world where you would be required to have multiple skills and how you how you uh, how flexible I mean, I mean the flexi your flexibility within within uh, multiple skills uh, will give you will give you an upper hand as opposed to being too specialized to the level that when an organization looks at you, they're like, uh, if we if we just put you in this, unless unless we are talking about science courses, by the way, just just to be clear, unless we are talking about science courses or engineering courses. Otherwise, when you when you're in other uh, social sciences and all and uh, you know business and all you know politics and uh, policy kinda kinda thing, I think it's 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 safer to go the general way, and I wouldn't limit myself. Uh, to say these courses we won't be in demand or these courses will be less in demand. Yeah, Steve, I think I I have a I have a differing opinion with you, but sure. I, I will I will just share it and put it out there for someone who's thinking about considering um, such like things. Yeah, it feels that the world is moving towards um, generalization. I think it's better to have a skill. 
It's very, I think it's very, very important that there is something that when you're brought to the table, you're specifically adding. You can know every other thing, it's fine. For example, I am huge, I'm big on health innovation, health data analytics, big health data, um, public health. And, and, and right now I'm putting the two things that I love the most, epidemiology and health economics, because I, I'm, I'm in health, I understand it, I know it. But I also want to know the economics aspect of it, because without money, no program is running. You know, what's the policy? What is the policy field like? However, we have an option to specialize. If you do have an option to specialize where you actually see something and you have an option to probably go that way, by all means take it. I don't think it takes away from you. The PhD, the PhD program is open specifically for that. You can go general on your master's if you're not sure about which, which, which path you still want to take. You want to experiment because, you know, we are still young. We are still moving we are still getting to know ourselves and and identifying what it is that really interests us and where we see our future heading however don't if if you have an opportunity and you est and you establish um, an area that you find to be very interesting for you and you know for sure uh, at this early stage i would say go for it go for it and 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 go the farthest that you can in that particular field so that you're an authoritative figure in that field it's like uh, what's the name of this guy the guy who's the who's the economist in in Kenya, Ndi, Professor Ndi. Imagine if Ndi did uh, he did uh, economics, but not really like specializing in macroeconomics, but he just did you know something. I think he wouldn't be the authority that he is now. It takes work, of course. It takes a lot of things: work, your school, what you studied, blah blah blah. But if you have the chance to, don't let it pass you by. However, it's okay if you really still don't know and you're not sure. Also, yeah. Okay. Oh, well said. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mikal and Steve. Oh, oh yeah, just, just, just uh, sorry, I'm, sorry, Gabriel. I, I think okay. I, anyway, it's bad manners. I keep to, I keep on interrupting you. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, it's allowed here. So there's uh, those are uh, I think I forgot to answer Karen's questions on um, racism and how I dealt with it. Uh yeah, for me I've I've uh, I've experienced racism. I've um I've had people saying very unkind words when you're passing by. Uh, sometimes it's been subtle, where someone just uh, decides not to sit next to you in a bus or something. Um, but I think it's about you being aware that it's it's out there, you being aware that racism is out there, and knowing how to react internally, because it's more of like get, growing your internal shock absorbers as, op as opposed to as opposed to um, being reactive uh, on any any every other action, because um, I would say sometimes it's an unfair world. So for the black people, so you don't wanna be always uh, in loggerheads with people, because at the end of the day, uh, let me say it be doing any care. You're not in your home, nini. you're not in your home ground, and sometimes you're not. You might not be able to even prove your case if you if you get uh, if it gets that worse so yeah we see it it happens uh but sometimes we just put a blind eye um maybe after all the, the global protests that are happening things are going to be a little bit more uh more better for for people but uh yeah, just have at the back of your mind try to build internal shock absorbers um probably it will save you uh throughout the process or as Mikal said uh you know sometimes you get what you're looking out for. So if it if it's not in your if you if you're not considering like it's a big issue for you, then it will you'll never notice it. So don't go out looking for for racism. Otherwise, you'll you'll, you'll see it. It's there. Yeah. Um, Steve, can I just chime in on 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 one of the most profound things that I learned as an African who is who is currently studying abroad. Um, one of one of the most important and awakening calls that I've always had, but it became so intense, is that, guys, we are starting from a point of disadvantage. I'm telling you, it's it's crazy. That um, let me paint a picture for you. For us, when you're 18, that's when you have just completed. Likely, a number of us you have you have completed high school, and 
you're still in your mother's house. You're still thinking about like, what next for me? Some of us take driving school. Some of us take ICT. Some of us take data and SPSS classes. For, for, the, for the people in the other generation, what happens is by that time, they started working at 16. So at 16, someone is already working and stashing and working and stashing. And if you're talking about, about building generational wealth, if you're talking about being economically independent, for this person who's at, who at 18, they are still being paid for that 10K to go and study driving or whatever. And by the time they are, they, and they probably have to wait for a year or two to get into UON. Within these two years, you're probably just sort of in between trying to volunteer or, you know, do something to add value to your life. So at 20, you get into, into uni and you, you complete uni. If you're lucky enough to graduate at the first go, you complete uni by the time you're 24 or 25. And you leave uni and you start tamaking. And by the time you're getting your first solid job, it's probably a year and a half or two years after that. And, and by that time, you're already 26. And you get this job. And by the time you're just starting to settle in, your responsibilities all of a sudden come. Now you're looking, oh, I have to get a house. Oh, I have to, if you're, if you're a young guy, you have to get a house. If you're a young lady, you have to think about your, dependent, your, your independence as a person. So it gets really, really frustrating that by the time your life is actually starting, you're almost 30. And, and we don't think about this thing and how it, it affects um, the young people of, of our generations. So what I'd like to, to say, which I have noticed, is if you're starting at 30, it means you only have something like 30 years of active work to start. And that is if you're constantly working. And you know that the work environment that we have is... is is really not as stable. So when you're, when you're thinking through your life and the decisions that you're making at this point, always have that in mind. The idea is to be economically independent, to be able to, as a full human being, function and be productive in a society. Our society robs us of that. We accept it. But because you have the information, you can decide to make decisions that empower you to be able to do better for yourself and this could include one completely leaving the environment that is stifling you and getting something for yourself or two making deliberate decisions that will put you on a pedestal that will make you reach quickly towards what it is you want to do so that you're not you're not starting out your life at 30 and and this really saddened me because i was talking to my roommate and and she's she's uh 23 and she's already completing her pharmacy degree she already has an offer here that pays her up to up to 30,000 a year. She has no responsibilities. She's still living as a student. She, she is saving and saving and buying stocks and investing. And she's 23. Imagine by the time that, and she has a, she has, she has a five year contract, by the way, by the time that she's 28, she's 30, she will have more opportunities than you ever will have in your entire life. And it's the same world and we are all competing for something, to make something out of our lives. So I think the pressure not to relax should always be there so that you're always making decisions that are going to put you at an, at, at, at an advantage opportunity so that you're not looking at retirement in poverty. That's what's happening in our, in our society and it's a, a recycle. It's recycling and recycling and recycling. So, so um, I'm not saying that the opportunities are not there in our home countries. But if they are there, how can we get them quickly so that we can move on? And, and, and you know, your most productive years are when you're younger. This is when you can make all the mistakes and just, and just uh, get up quickly and, and move on. You can lose even if it's, if it's uh, a million shillings. You can lose it and you'll still recover if you're, in your, if, you're, if you're young or you're in your early 30s or whatever. Anybody can, but it's quicker for someone who's, who has time on their side. So even as we make our decisions um, um, at this point, let's have that in mind to never relax. Don't relax. Don't relax at all. If you're in Kenya and you're working, you're always thinking about how best can you better your life, even where you are there, so that there's no relaxation. You're not just, just sitting and thinking. You're publishing. You're writing. You're making sure that you're meeting with people who can make your work move forward so that, so that that motivation is very intrinsic and it pushes you. And when you start doing that, you see things change slowly by slowly. Um, 
and yeah that's all i wanted to say but i feel like it's really been burning me every person who i meet this is the kind of conversation i want to have with them because because we are disadvantaged from the beginning mm. we don't have generational wealth we don't have parents who in fact most often for most of us our parents we are the ones who take care of them when they are aging they don't have their own that they already kept for themselves so it's drain it's draining what you would have kept for yourself and for your family and for your generation of your matriarch or your patriarch or whatever it is you want to call it so if we have that kind of thinking it affects the decisions that we make now and and and, and i think that's really important to mention as well yeah wow <laughs> thank you very much mikal well said well said uh you've made it so clear that we are starting from a disad- uh, point of disadvantage thank you for reminding us that so uh our environment and our world always has some things to show us that but thank you for reminding us that well um i'm sincerely grateful for the t- the the session that we've had the conversations that we've had uh i believe it was worth it for everyone who came or everyone who was able to be here thank you so much sincerely for Mikal and Steve for being so selfless uh, and so uh, honest with us sharing your experiences personal experiences personal lessons that you've had um, and being so clear you are not you are i like the way you've been very practical in all the 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 ideas that you've shared using you as the examples that makes more sense than uh, the abstract information that otherwise we can get online so thank you very much for making it personal and for sharing very kindly and very honestly some of the experiences that you've undergone so i think it would only be fair um, to conclude at this point um but this is a conversation that we must have again so uh, if you allow us we will still reach out eh, and so that we can be able to have uh, more of this I see many people who would have really loved this because I know they've been pursuing uh, opportunities in this area but they are not here. So we will probably get another chance and another forum to to handle some of this. So at this point I would wish to ask um three people uh at random if you feel inspired enough so three people uh to thank uh, or in their own ways eh, to thank Mikal and Steve in their own ways and also to maybe uh, just remind them of a lesson or two that they've picked to show them that the time they spent here is worth it then we'll give them a chance to conclude uh then we'll let you go and uh, have some water right? because you must have talked a lot for 1 hour 30 2 hours actually so um just three people at random to appreciate and to thank Steve and Michael Yeah 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 um so let me thank uh Stephen uh we know each other i think in some form of way Mika uh we don't know each other thank you so much for for taking your time to talk to us and to opening our minds about what what's happening in outside there the UK and Canada so thank you for that not i'd like to have your contact i i run a podcast i probably we could something um on the same line to to also talk to other young people about the opportunities they can tap into and existing scholarships and all those things and so i come to you on a personal level. so can you uh, if, if you can put your your contacts in the in the comments i'd be i'd be glad thank you thank you very much bonfest I'm um, happy that this would provide a chance for further collaborations through your podcast and the other activities that you do to also help others. Thank you very much for that. Uh okay, so two more to appreciate and thank uh Mikael and Matshua Steve. Gabriel. Yes, Daniel. <laughs> Good evening. This is Daniel. Yes, Daniel. Yeah. Well, uh, for the let's say one and a half hours that I've been here, mm. 
I think I have learned several things. At least I have filled three pages. The rest I'm sure you only had two. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you so much. Uh, I really loved listening to Steve and uh, Miss Wagga because you didn't get to And uh, particularly, I I picked something that we are starting from a disadvantaged position. I well, it it seems that was so outstanding to me, and uh, maybe from I think from that starting alone, I'll be motivated to at least try catching up if if not allows. But then I have also learned the art of speaking to your recommenders and uh, not really having such a big name to recommend you with the harsh words, but having a, it, it, it may be a small name, but with the good words. Mm. And I think that was quite insightful. Alafu, I realized that Miss Waga is, is under Shesha Wedding Scholarship, at least from the list I could, I could gather. And she shared her mail somewhere just before I could uh, grab it. And, and I had to restart and lose the mail. Uh, I think we will have to get in touch because this, uh, I really want to, uh, you know, I am hoping to, to land a scholarship at Shevening. Well, and uh, several lessons. One, you may pick deadlines and having just a board rather book to to write the deadlines and everything so that you can keep track of everything you are doing. That was quite a session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daniel. And I'm very happy to see you here. You may actually talk to Mikal and talk to Steve so that you can maybe feature them in Daily Nation or um, write about them, just something so that many people can get to know some of these ideas. Uh, we keep making mistakes, eh? like Steve started applying in 2015, but only managed to get something in 2018, I think. So that's three that's years, eh? that is the story of many people. They apply yeah. and they keep up. So we yeah. need to write about this. We need to write about this in our blogs. I'm happy Bonfest again is thinking of doing something with the podcast. You can write this in the Daily Nation. Another person can do it somewhere else. So that we are, we all expand this conversation. Fanon, I would really love that you talk to uh, both our guests, so that you can write about this in your blog. We can this yes. discussion going. Yeah. Yes. Just before you see you, okay. Uh, maybe I could uh, have their contacts, mm. so that for the next few weeks I could get in touch with them for a possible story idea, rather a published idea, for maybe lifestyle and my network that specifically deals with the youth. Okay, okay. Yes. I think they've, uh, they've yeah. shared, the, uh, Mikal especially has shared her contacts on the chat. You may check it out. Uh, but if you... Yes, I... Yeah, uh -huh. Steve also is going to share, uh, but uh, I think they can still share. Uh, I'll appreciate wow. Thank you very much, Daniel. Yes. Uh, Thank welcome. you. One more, one more, then we can close. Just one more person to say a word of thank you to our guests. Preferably a lady. <laughs> I can see Karen. Only Karen is here. Uh, yes, so Karen, very few. Karen and Vera, yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for your insight. I have learned that I think I would have learned elsewhere. Um, having you at the meeting, which is very informative. Karen, we have the challenge you had that, that time. We are not able to hear you clearly. You can get closer again. Okay, yeah. can you hear me now? That's better, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I was saying thank you for sacrificing your time to come and have this session with us. I have really learned a lot. Um, 
that I'm not sure of them most of them. And uh, one thing that struck me is, you know, when you when you said that when you look for something, you will actually find it. So like in your example where you said. Yes. Uh, Karen, I'm really sorry, but I can see Mikal struggling to hear you. So I think you have to do some magic. Uh, okay, let me just use the chat box. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> that should have been very nice to hear it from you, but thank you for that. Yeah, so you can see Vera has also mentioned that. Thank you very much, Steve and Mikal, for your time and sharing the insights. Uh, they are not only they are not only applied to fishing abroad. Uh, maybe she meant to say they do not only apply, but uh, also, yeah. Thank you very much. That is the the, the bottom line. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mikal. So you can give us your last words. Mm, then uh, you know your last words or last uh, points. Then we can be able to close. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve, for for uh, uh, Gabriel for this wonderful invitation. I didn't know that Steve was going to be here <laughs> until I saw the poster. That's really interesting because, by the way, guys, let me just mention, when I started, when I was still in uni first year, I volunteered with Steve's organization. It was called uh, Change Mind, Change Future. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got to know so many other people who now have gone to different places in life. Um, and it's really interesting that we have met again on this platform. So mine is just to wish you the best, all the best as you as you pursue your you know your opportunities and and the places where you want to go. Nobody is ever sure. It's just about taking the step, even when you're shaking. Just take the step. It doesn't matter. Just take it and see what comes out of it. And never ever forget that as an African child who doesn't come from a rich family or a family where there's generational wealth you are already starting from a point of disadvantage so every single decision you make is geared towards bettering yourself and you are changing the lives and you can potentially change the the future of your generation through your patriarch or through your matriarch so you so you have the ability to actually change those things um and we also don't know where the future is heading but we are excited we stay excited and we keep trying and gabriel and myself always have this have this statement let's keep trying i think he says it to everybody <laughs> i yeah. think it says it to everyone so all the best reach out if you if you um if you are in the process of applying for something or are not sure about something reach out and let people help you there are people who out here who are good people and they will help you and they will not expect anything from you and there are people who will also not help you at all so be prepared to have that um, and also be prepared to be beaten down so bad but because of the rejections that you will receive. Let me just prepare you in advance. It's psychologically torturing. I can't tell you how many times I cried. I cried so many times um, when I got rejections. I almost uh, wanted to give up, but of course I didn't. I would cry today and then tomorrow in the middle of the night, I'm still typing on my computer. So <laughs> I just felt like, like, if I give up, what else do I have? You know, mm -hmm. like there's no other option. If literally I was to get into Oxford or Harvard, which I'm really targeting now, I wouldn't be able to pay that school fee, period. There's no exception. So I knew that I want the best for myself. I know that I can't have it on my own. So whatever the cost I have to pay for me to be able to get it, I will do it. So it's a decision. Just make the decision, move forward with it. However, however, um, difficult it is persevere and 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 look for other options as well don't just limit yourself to this it could probably come in the form of a fellowship whatever look for that and forge your path as you want it to be god bless blessings to you guys it was really lovely getting to speak with you i wish i could see your videos and see people's faces <laughs> you decided to hide so all good all good though <laughs> Thank you very much, Mikala. Sante sana. I I wish we could all clap, uh, but I think some of us are clapping digitally. So thank you so much for being so selfless. And as you rightly said, let's keep trying. <laughs> yes, Steve, uh, now after ladies first, so after the lady, then you definitely know that you're next. 
<laughs> no, I, I was almost protesting. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and say, uh, say men matter. Uh, because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's turning out like uh, a lot of men are not applying for opportunities. So we need to, we need to kind of build confidence uh, uh, around our men and their young young boys. Uh, but yeah, so first is to say thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better platform to speak about this. Uh, because I'm personally known to you, Gabriel, Mikal, and uh, some people here. I I saw Samuel, uh, I saw Boniface, and others who probably left at some point. Um, but yeah, generally it's to say um, we've walked through this journey. Uh, so we've met. We met when we just had ideas mm -hmm. on, on uh, you know on on what we needed to do, and here we are in different spaces and um, i think that that should be the spirit sort of growing together and upli uh, uplifting each other up because I'm, I'm i'm constantly realizing that uh, some of these opportunities that we are talking about they were kind of confined in some groups uh, sort of we are coming from a classism sort of a country so for us to to ensure that there are equal opportunities or equal spaces for for growth for everyone we need to we need to democratize this uh, opportunity space and uh, we'll 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 do it through such platforms which i'm grateful for uh what but pod, uh, i mean what bonfast is offering and daniel any any other person who's sending the word out there uh let's grow that culture of sharing our learning and uh I guess uh, in our own small spaces, uh, we're going to change a lot. And for me, I think this has been more of a learning opportunity than, uh, than uh, it would be. I mean, I think I've, I've learned more than, than what, I, what I probably expected to give. Uh, so, and that should be uh, perhaps the spirit going forward. So thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Mikal. And thanks everyone else who uh, showed up for this conversation. And I, I look forward to more engagement. I'm always a uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, text away. Uh, I know Gabriel uh, knows that I can take even a week before I respond, but I'll <laughs> still respond. <laughs> yeah, depending on what's, uh, what's happening in my life at the moment. But yeah, so let's engage. Uh, make use of the digital space. It's an open space. And if you ever feel like you need uh, uh, to consult or ask anything, I'm happy to take you through the journey. And I'm saying this because I've seen 12 people get scholarships. Uh, let me just uh, toot my flute. That's an investment of almost 50 million going directly <laughs> to people. Uh, for someone who had to struggle for three years to get scholarships, but is able to grow uh, grow others. And I think that's I think that's that's the that's where I get my fire from, you know, that fun, burning desire to get more into the space. So let's do this. Wow. And God bless you. Thank you very much. That's a very historic speech. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> a very, <laughs> a moment like uh, the moments that will remain in history as Steve in this speech that he delivered here. Thank you very much for ending it in a way that we'll all remember. Thank you, Mikal. Um, thank you all. I see a number of uh, appreciation here from Mugeni. Mugeni says thank you very much both. Uh, Samuel, very insightful. Thank you all for your time. Really appreciated. And also Vinky is grateful. Yeah, and uh, Karen also is very grateful. Thank you for the session and for your time. I've learned a lot. I would, not, I would have not learned anywhere else. And this information is applicable in many spaces other um, other than applying to go abroad. So thank you so much. I believe it was worth everyone's time. And may God bless you. Uh, if you, uh, Writers Guild Kenya always has uh, different avenues through which we try to grow other people. This is one of them, weekly Writers Ecclesia, where we just come together, united by books, but also Books don't stand on uh, um You can't be a writer. We are human beings first. So we need this opportunity. So we always do different things, but with a view to growing writers and also growing people who come in contact with us. So if you're a writer, 
you may reach out to us. We have platforms that may help you grow. And also, if you generally would wish to grow, you, you may find us useful. We've left the email here. But if you just Google Writers Guild Kenya or you go to our website, you'll find the contacts that you can reach us directly. Thank you so much. Uh, next week, we have a session on Kiswahili, <laughs> Writers Ecclesia in Kiswahili. So if you'd wish to, uh, you know, to refine your Kiswahili, Mikal, if you'd wish not to forget, uh, you are welcome next week. So thank you so much and all the best in all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye, bye, bye.